Your brain has about 86 billion neurons, and each one of those neurons is sending an electrical message, which we call a spike, to other neurons. Now, most of the experiments we do at Backyard Brains, we're interested in recording from those spikes and understanding what that information actually means. But today, we're going to look at what happens inside the neuron when the spike hits the end of the line. Our experiment today harkens back to one of the earliest debates in neuroscience. After the Italian scientist Camilla Golgi invented a technique for staining the brain slices such that just a small fraction of the brain would become visible, you could begin to make out the beautiful structures within the brain architecture. To Golgi, the brain was different than the rest of the body. So instead of cells, the nervous system simply consisted of a single continuous network, which he called the reticulum. After all, we have consciousness and experiences, and those don't seem like they come from just cells. But to the Spanish scientist Ramon y Cajal, these stains show that the cells were each independent units and they had small gaps between them to pass chemical messages. But the separations were so small that we just couldn't see them. But it wasn't until the 1950s until electron microscopy finally confirmed the existence of individual neurons in the central nervous system. And it also confirmed the existence of gaps between the neurons called the synapse. These gaps are impossibly close on the order of 20 to 40 nanometers and for reference, a sheet of paper is about 100,000 nanometers thick. So today we're gonna to be doing some experiments to find out what's happening inside that synapse. And to do that, we're gonna be using crickets as our model organism and some household chemicals that also double as a neurotransmitter inside the brain. To do that, we're gonna need a few items. We're gonna need our neuron spiker box, a cup of ice water, some insulin syringes, some cigarettes, some MSG that you can find in your grocery store aisles, some saline, and some crickets. So we're using crickets in our experiment today because they're smaller than our roaches, they are easily found in pet stores, and they have a circle system, which is a wind detector that we're gonna use in our experiments. Now it's unknown if crickets feel any pain, but it's always good to assume that they do and try to alleviate any suffering by anesthetizing it. So we're using ice water because crickets are cold-blooded, which means they're gonna take the same temperature as the outside environment. So when they're in cold water, they're getting ice cold inside. And when things get colder, things slow down. And if you remember inside a neuron, the ion channels open and close. And so when things get colder, they stop opening and closing, which means they stop sending spikes. And when they stop sending spikes, they stop feeling pain and they stop moving. So now that we know that the cricket is anesthetized, we can move him to the spiker box. We're gonna place a cricket belly up so that we can record from its ventral nerve cord. We're gonna place two electrodes right on its midline, a little bit closer to the bottom, to be able to record from the circle system. Okay, so now we got our electrodes in place. So what we need to do is turn on a recording device to see if we're getting some spikes. And we are. Now the next question is, what do these spikes represent? So we're recording from the circle system. The circle system are the two surcis that look like antennas in the back of the cricket. And what they do is they detect wind. And so when I blow on it, you should see a response. So you can see how the system works. When I was blowing on it, you heard spikes. That's how the brain knows there's something coming and he jumps away, which makes it really hard to catch a cricket. So it's the sensory neurons from the circle system that we're gonna target. They send their axons directly to the ventral nerve cord and it's at that synapse that we're gonna be doing our experiments. The first neurotransmitter receptor we're gonna target is glutamate. Now, glutamate is amino acid normally produced by the body, but it can also be found in additives such as MSG. Now, the G in MSG is glutamate, so it's a monosodium glutamate. So what we need to do is mix it into a solution so it can find its way into the synapse. To be sure we get the glutamate into the synapse, we're going to mix it with some saline to make it into a liquid solution. You don't need to make too much because we're only going to be using just a little bit in our cricket. So the next neurotransmitter receptor we're going to target is acetylcholine. Now this is a bit harder because your body produces acetylcholine and there's certain things that you can eat, for example nuts, that have the precursors to acetylcholine but not acetylcholine itself. But fear not because there are nicotinic acetylcholine receptors and what that means is that nicotine is an agonist meaning that it does the exact same thing that acetylcholine would do. So it binds equally to both nicotine and acetylcholine. So what we can do is take a cigarette and soak this into the solution to allow the nicotine to escape but it's not gonna be as clear as the glutamate. What we're trying to do is just soak the tobacco into the saline. 
Now once you get it all mixed up, let it sit overnight or even longer to allow the nicotine to escape into the solution. It will stink pretty badly, so put a cap on it. All right, we have our prep in place. We have our two solutions that we made. Now we just see one more thing. Every experiment needs a control, so we're just gonna inject just the saline solution into a syringe. And the reason we wanna do that is we wanna make sure that it's not the saline that's causing this, the reaction, but it's the chemicals that's released inside the saline. So I'm gonna inject the saline, uh, and I'm gonna start using a dropper to actually act as the wind. The first thing we wanna do is make sure that we get a neural response. Good. So let's inject the saline solution. You want to put the tip of the needle sort of in between the two pins. So now we're going to see if our control has any effect. I'm going to blow on it like we did before and see if it has the same response. So there you go. It doesn't have much of an effect, at least neuropharmacologically. Try saying that three times fast. So it means that the control is a good control. It means that it's not having an effect, at least uh, for what we can tell, on the nervous system. All right, so now it's time to do some neuropharmacology. And we're gonna start with glutamate. Now, glutamate in the brain is an amino acid that is an excitatory neurotransmitter. Now, this means that when the neurotransmitter glutamate hits the receptor, that that neuron is more likely to fire so we should see an increase in firing when glutamate is injected into the cricket. Let's try it out. So we're gonna do the same thing we did before, only now we're gonna inject it with a little bit of the glutamate solution. Again, we're gonna place the needles in between the two pins and inject about 0.1 milliliters. I'm gonna blow on the circle system one more time. Interesting. So it looks like instead of being an excitatory neurotransmitter, as glutamate is in our body, in fact, 90% of our neurotransmitters are excitatory glutamatergic neurons, right? And so not happening here. In fact, it's having the opposite effect. It's inhibiting the spikes from happening. So if I blow on it, absolutely nothing's happening. Even though the neurons are firing inside the circle system, we assume when it synapses onto those neurons in the central nervous system, it's completely shut down because the activation of these glutamate is turning off those neurons. This makes sense because about 365 million years ago, we diverged and we had some chemicals in our bodies, but they just used it for a completely different purpose. So now we're gonna see what happens when we inject the nicotine into the cricket. So again, I'm gonna place it between the two pins and I'm going to inject it. Now look at that, that is an excitatory response. And this is what we're expecting in the glutamate, but we see it right now in the acetylcholine. Now in the human body, the acetylcholine is found in our neuromuscular junctions to make our muscles move. But here it's found in the central nervous system. Nicotine is a neurotoxin for invertebrates, which may explain why certain plants like tobacco evolved to produce it. So our brains have both excitatory and inhibitory neurons because if it only had excitatory, then our brains would spin out of control with having firing, firing, firing going faster. But the inhibitory neurons help to keep that in check and there's a good balance between the inhibitory and the excitatory. So today we learned exactly how neurons communicate with each other. You know, some neurotransmitters help to increase the firing rate of the next neuron while others cause them to switch off. Now it's through this interplay of excitatory and inhibitory messages that allow our brain to maintain a balance. And the balance between excitation and inhibition is a key principle to the organization of our neural network and for information processing. And in fact, an imbalance between the excitation and inhibition is thought to be a mechanism behind many brain disorders, including autism. So now it's time for you to ask some questions. What other chemicals that affect neurons could you use in the cricket? And why are we using the circle system in the first place? Could we just use a standard leg prep? And if you can answer that, I think you understand how neurotransmitters work. We look forward to hearing from your results.